my public. When Marston threatened to publish his fallout findings, the Australian intelligence service, ASIO, marked his file, scientist of counter-espionage interest. Marston was convinced he was being spied on, that his phone was being tapped and that his mail was being interfered with. My dear Dave, the secret police had been tampering with my private mail. Perhaps they imagined they could frighten me into silence. I endured this indignity for long enough to obtain complete proof and then asked the people responsible to cease their nonsense or I'd call for a public inquiry. Arrogance and this sort of thing is rapidly changing Anglophiles into Anglophobes. Marston realises that uh, he's in a very dangerous situation. Not only are the British wanting to curtail his, the experiments, the uh, security net is closing in. It had become the most politically charged dispute in Australian science. In his report, Marston accused the Safety Committee of lying to the Australian people about fallout. His findings of iodine-131 in sheep and cattle were proof that large areas of the Australian continent had been contaminated. This, he said, would result in increased cases of thyroid cancer in humans. But Marston went further. The presence of iodine-131 in animals, he said, meant that an even more dangerous radioactive isotope had contaminated the food chain, strontium-90. We have low levels of strontium-90 falling out of the atmosphere at that time and landing on the herbage, being eaten by the cow, accumulating like calcium does in the milk of cows, are then in this concentrated form, it's called biological magnification, going down the gullets of children. When humans drink that milk, babies and children in particular, who are laying down bone very quickly, their bones are the places where the strontium and the calcium eventually wind up and once it's there, it doesn't go away again. It stays there with its 29 years half-life. So in 29 years, half the activity is still there. In 58 years, a quarter of the activity is still there. If Marston was correct, strontium-90 uptake would be dramatically increased by government policy, which guaranteed a half pint of milk daily to every school child. There is a very serious likelihood that internal radiation from strontium-90 may, after a latent period of some years, result in many painful deaths from cancer of the bone. Your unequivocal assurance that the fall... Marston was now on a collision course with the most powerful forces in the British Commonwealth. If he published his report, as he threatened, it could jeopardise future atomic testing in Australia. The British demanded Marston return their test equipment, and Ernest Titterton, the new head of the safety committee, insisted he delete his attacks on the committee's competence and his claims about strontium-90 contamination. Marston had never measured strontium-90, but in his report, he left no doubt where his detractors would find it. He states right at the end of his report, the proof will be found in the bones of children. All one has to do is to examine the strontium-90 load in the bones of deceased people, and particularly children, in the coming decades, to show that I am right. Strontium-90 
During the late 50s, I was employed by the Department of Supply in Perth. And as part of my duties, I was asked to attend a large public hospital and receive from the pathology department of that hospital a package which I was to on forward to the Eastern States. On receiving this package, I identified bones as being those of young children. I thought to myself, bloody hell, what's going on here? Soon after Marston delivered his report, the safety committee contacted pathologists in every capital city. They were asked to provide bones from bodies undergoing autopsy. I was able to talk to the people in the pathology department as to what this was all about. And I was told that the bones were taken to the Eastern States, they were ashed and analysed for the presence of strontium-90. Throughout 1958, more than 400 bone samples were analysed. In all cases, the next of kin were never told. The secretary of the safety committee wrote to all of the participating pathologists very early in the program uh, a letter saying, it may have occurred to you that the general public would not take kindly um, to the question of removal of bones for purposes of radioactive uh, testing and I therefore ask you to um, uh, treat this matter as, as confidential. The bones of people of all ages were analysed, but the safety committee requested as many from babies and stillborns as possible. We know that in some cases whole femurs of a baby of babies were taken out. Perhaps little tiny bones, maybe only that big. Um, um, in other cases, it was skull samples, vertebrae, because they could easily be taken out from autopsy. In Titterton's first report to the government, Marston's suspicions had been realised. Strontium-90 was indeed widespread in the Australian population. Infants showed levels up to five times higher than adults. But the levels, Titterton claimed, were well below the safety threshold and would not cause damage to cells or result in cancer. The issue was that there was no real knowledge of whether there was a threshold value um, below which it was safe to get radioactivity. The safety committee assumed there was. Headley said there's no evidence for that and you have no right to reassure the public that they are not in any danger. It was a question now dividing scientists around the globe. Was there a safe level of radioactive fallout? According to the best estimates of geneticists, all of whom agree, 15,000 children are sacrificed for every large bomb tested. It is possible there is damage. It is even possible, to my mind, that there is no damage. And there is the possibility, furthermore, that very small amounts of radioactivity are helpful. But the most dramatic assessment came at an international conference attended by Mark Oliphant. Twenty of the world's leading scientists warned Strontium-90 could irreversibly damage the human race. The elephant came back very reassuringly to Marston, saying that the kind of uh, opinions that were now merging internationally on this question of fallout were entirely vindicating his own opinion. Finally, in August 1958, after 18 months of stalling by the safety committee, Marston succeeded in publishing an edited version of his report in a respected CSIRO journal. But far from the political explosion Headley Marston had predicted, the story was only reported in a small circulation farmer's newspaper.